Deborah, I'm going to ask you to start off because they're your guidelines, as it were, your team's guidelines. So what's the importance, what's the significance of launching these risk reduction guidelines? Let me first say thank you for this opportunity uh, being here and, and with this uh, audience uh, present. I think that uh, it was in the introductory video, it was in the uh, words of uh, Minister of Health, it was in the words of my own boss. Uh, it, uh, the, the number of people suffering from dementia is huge. We are talking about 50 million and we are talking about 10 million more every year, which is something that is uh, uh, extremely relevant. The um, cost of that is also uh, significant, and the numbers that we saw are even so big that are hard to understand, I think, for, for any of us. The um, WHO has been then working on this for a number of years. We were discussing earlier with some colleagues in 2012 was the first declaration and document saying dementia is important for public health. Then we, ca we had a ministerial uh, meeting in 2015 and then an action plan that says what countries should be doing in this. In the action plan, one of the areas of, of relevance is the risk reduction. So this is one more initiative that we are undertaking in uh, the, the, the big uh, challenge ahead that we have as agency, but also mostly as uh, partners with ministries of health, governments all over the, the world, to see how can we advance and uh, take uh, some initiatives that will, at some point in time, hopefully not too far away, reduce these uh, scary numbers, both in terms of people suffering, families and communities, and of course the cost also that is implied in that. Professor Utterson, how do you see the significance of this, the launch of these guidelines? Well, I think this is a major step forward. Uh, it's quite clear that uh, what we have seen over the past decade attempts to come up with new treatments that have consistently failed. So this highlights the need to look into preventive measures. And I think uh, this uh, is a successful attempt to uh, systematize what is now about the risk factors and to help health providers cope with them and give good suggestions to patients and to society at large. So this is a milestone, I would say, in our work to create what you said should be a dementia-friendly society. Because dementia is not a disease, it's a societal challenge. Oh wow, that's a great line. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Dementia is not a disease, it's a societal challenge. We should keep returning to that. So ladies and gentlemen, take a look at those jazzy and rather wonderful um, slides up there that the WHO has created for us. And these are the, the, the main elements of the guidelines. And as you can see, exercise and um, not smoking and using your brain and exercise again. Um, there's a huge overlap, Deborah, with um, the other stuff we know we should be doing, right? To improve our health, our heart health, and try and reduce diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. Well, indeed, and, and uh, something that we can say is that uh, we have to take care not only about, uh, of our body, but we have to take care also of our brain with the same measures we are doing. Uh, such we are promoting a uh, healthy diet, we are promoting physical activity, tobacco limitation, not smoking, uh, reduced consumption of alcohol, all measures that, as you said, are part of the NCD uh, strategy. What is the problem there? That the, when we measure where we are in terms of advanced countries advancing to achieve the uh, targets that were set up for the NCDs, we are really behind. We are really not where we should be. Even the most developed countries are still not meeting the uh, targets and uh, the, the best price that are uh, called the, the interventions that are more effective. Uh, they, are, they are really lagging behind and uh, uh, low and middle income countries, of course, even farther away from achieving that. So we are going to reinforce by saying we need to take care also of our brain with the same measure. So, so, so I'm going to ask you this, yes. considering how difficult it has been to really get people to change their behaviours, let's face it, um, how will throwing dementia and brain health into the mix actually change things? How is it going to change the momentum? Well, we hope that it is, uh, it's going to change because of the numbers we are talking about and uh, once the 
health practitioners, the healthcare providers, and the community at large understands that by reducing some of these intakes, by limiting uh, uh, tobacco consumption, by uh, being more active, will also improve their uh, possibility to prevent uh, dementia, then this is a, an added uh, uh, reason, I would say, why we need to get uh, that. It's a way of reinforcing each other. So. Professor uh, Utterson, is it, do, do you think that adding dementia to the mix is, is, the, is the kind of tipping point that's going to make these um, lifestyle changes, social changes more compelling? Well, there is a perspective that is, I dare say, missing in uh, these guidelines, and that is uh, the fact that life choice, the lifestyle choices are not made in a socio-economic and political way. In a vacuum? In a vacuum. Right. You, you have to also address the socio-economic factors, the political factors, in order to come up with a solution for this societal challenge. So what do you mean by that? What, well, there are distinguished guests here from Chile today, and uh, not long time ago, I had a conversation with uh, Michel Bachelet, the president of Chile, that illustrates what I'm aiming at. In Chile, they, at, that, at that time, they wanted to put graphic warning labels on unhealthy foods, traffic light, the light signals, to, to help prevent children, for example, eating unhealthy foods. But there were trade agreements that precluded, at that time, the Chilean government from doing so. Politics intervened restricted the policy space for health. That's a, I wouldn't say a beautiful example, it's a classic example, that we don't just have to address the individual choices. We have to look at the socio-economic and political space in which these choices are being made. So I think that the target audience for this report should be expanded not only to be addressing healthcare providers, but also those that are responsible for politics and the socio-economic framework within so that is, choices. So that is extremely ambitious, but if, Professor, please. But if I may add, I, you will see, I hope you will read the guidelines because they are very easy to read and go in through, to go through. Uh, you will see that there are references to other policies and action plans, etc., that the WHO has issued over time, and we can't cover everything in one document. I fully agree that <coughs> some of these measures should be uh, some of this is responsibility of the individual, it's responsibility of the carer, but a lot of it is responsibility of the society, of governments. The policies that are the called best advice that I mentioned, how to limit the access to alcohol, how to limit the, uh, pack the packaging of uh, tobacco. This is not responsibility of the individual, it's a responsibility of uh, in the institutions and the society and the governments in general that will Facilitate. Another issue we recommend walking in many countries I've been uh, living in and working in, you can't go out for a walk because it's, uh, security is not good. Yeah. Or, uh, or there's no pavement or, there's or no sidewalks. So you come that is, of course, not responsibility. Of the, it's harder to imagine a person walking around the table at home. We need to also generate spaces that will really invite and promote also these healthy habits that we are recommending them. Not everything and this is not a high priority, priority, is it? Providing exercise spaces sure. is not really a very high priority for most governments, yes? So how do you make these things? At the top of your list of guidelines is exercise. Mm -hmm. How on earth do we make exercise something that's realistic for people who are working very long hours, um, are relying on public transport? Where, where, how, does, how is this a meaningful guideline? How do we turn it into something realistic? Professor Utterson. Well, this again highlights the need to address also uh, the uh, political level of society and the city planners, for instance. Now we are at a turning point. More than 50% of the world's population, they live in cities. One should really plan cities so as to promote physical exercise. This is not a choice of the individual, but a choice of the political level. So can I just ask you one final question before I throw the questions open to the floor? So think of your questions, ladies and gentlemen. I'm about to, to pounce on you. What do you hope will be the uptake, um, Deborah? What, what are you hoping will happen next with these guidelines? Well, we will work uh, seriously in disseminating these guidelines and making sure that they land at country level, that health professionals are aware of that, that training packages are developed and available for health professionals, that uh, carers are also aware of that, the communities, and we will do some complementary tools 
in order to make this uh, usable, if I may say. That will be one of the main issues. Uh, Professor Thurston? Yeah. Well, there are three major issues that have to be addressed in order to meet the SDG goal 2030, which says that we, are, we should reduce by one third the uh, prevalence of NCDs, including then dementia. The first thing is invest in research. Invest in research. What is so clear in this report is that evidence is missing mm -hmm. or not sufficient for some of the recommendations. So few of these recommendations are perceived as strong recommendations simply because of lack of adequate research. Invest in research. And in Sweden, it's not in the, uh, with a strategy. You need to follow up, that, follow up with an investment. That's point one. Invest in research. Point two, education. I mean, dementia is such a challenging, it's also a disease, challenging disease. It requires special devotion to the education programs. And I'm happy to be here today because just a few weeks ago, we handed off diplomas to health professionals from the, the, the Silvia Hemmet, and they have the, their teaching in part from uh, our colleagues at Karinska Institute. And uh, I think this is exactly the way to go, to also focus on education. And I'm happy to be here today with uh, Her Majesty the Queen, who supports this uh, education in such a fantastic way. The third thing, the third thing which is also extremely important, is to have a global view of what is happening. There's no way that we can come up with uh, solutions in one individual country. We have to work on the global scale. And one of the projects that is so relevant here is the Finger Project that is headed by Professor Mia Kivi Pento, who is also part of this work. And uh, this is an attempt to gather information from more than 20 different countries. And there will be more eventually, I'm sure. Because these are so formidable challenges that have to be addressed at the global level. Thank you very much, Professor Utterson and Deborah Castell. Who would like to put a question to them? Let me move the mic in this direction. Jeremy Hughes from the Alzheimer's Society UK. Thank you. Um, I think the production of these guidelines is very important and a major step forward. I want to pick up on what Professor Utterson said, and it's not just because I'm sitting next to him that I like his reference to it being a societal challenge, but I really think it is. And to ask a question about taking it one step further from what he said, we know from the Lancet Commission review a couple of years ago that low education and attainment at primary school level increases your risk of dementia. Do you think to increase awareness and awareness of prevention, we should have compulsory in the school curriculum something about dementia and dementia awareness? Should I respond to that? Please. You're referring to the Livingston uh, uh, Lancet uh, Commission. And of course, this uh, commission comes up with some of the same sort of arguments and evidence that you find in these guidelines. It's quite clear that education is important from many points of view. And in fact, one of the reports from, recent reports from UK says that even the fact of being educated reduces the risk of, um, of dementia. Of course, these are difficult things to investigate, but they say that for each additional year of education, you reduce the risk by 17%. So the, the coupling between education say and that again. dementia... Say that again. In, in this particular report, they claim that if you add one more year of education, you reduce the risk of dementia by 17%. Of course, this has been challenged, but the, and this is not addressed in, in this particular diet. That's the coupling between education and dementia is so strong, it cannot be neglected. Excellent. Can I get another question, Deborah? Yes. George Radenberg. Uh, George Radenberg, the Global CEO Initiative on Alzheimer's. So I concur that this is an important step forward. That the WHO continues leadership that has started in this area since 2012 and through the World Health Assembly Global Action Plan. And I agree totally with the call for additional research in this area. The United States and NIH has invested heavily. And our own organization in the United States has started a new brain health initiative to call for a checkup from the neck up every year uh, from health of the entire lifespan, because we know early uh, education as well as brain damage in early life, particularly in low-income communities, is important to later life brain health. So uh, we agree, and we're gonna hear more about the Green Brain Powerful Movement in the United States a little later. 
My question goes to this, because it, uh, there's some, I'm mildly disappointed in this report, as I mentioned to Deborah earlier, uh, in that some of the recommendations are not strong recommendations, but conditional recommendations. And I would just highlight one, and that is on alcohol abuse. Uh, here you have some evidence that, in fact, a reduction of dangerous levels of alcoholism, uh, in fact, are a, uh, are a cause of dementia or a cognitive impairment. And yet, as you weigh whether or not the benefits of reduced alcohol, dangerous alcohol consumption, outweigh the risks, you made a conditional recommendation and not a strong recommendation. So even though you put it up on the screen as an important element, uh, you don't make a strong recommendation on this or on Mediterranean diets uh, or on physical George. exercise. So I'm curious about why not strong as opposed to conditional. Thank you. I, I think that uh, uh, you will find the explanations, uh, detailed explanations in, in the document. The, the, the group that was in charge of this was I, I'm assessing the evidence available on the, uh, the relationship specifically with dementia. If, the, relation, if the, the evidence was not that strong, then it will be conditional. There is not much uh, to, to say about the same for education or other issues that are not here or that are uh, conditional. There is not enough evidence that demonstrates the relationship between the, the risk factor and uh, dementia. Then there is evidence on a number of issues and we know that it's not healthy to uh, drink alcohol. But then uh, that's why it's conditional. But we need the conditional means one by one we, cases. We need to, the, the, the practitioners, the, the medical uh, environment will need to assess and understand. That is the case on any, uh, on many of these, as you said. I should say that I was involved personally at the beginning of the process and then I just read them when they were ready to come up a, a few weeks ago. And I was asking, okay, we don't have, we don't have many strong uh, recommendations. What are we saying? What are we doing here? And the issue is we need more research, as it was mentioned before. We need more research also from low and middle income countries because most of the research is limited also from high income countries. So it represents just one perspective of the problem and not fully. But this is the, re the reality in many of the issues. And this is the starting point then, presumably. Are you going to keep updating these guidelines? We are going to more? keep updating them every five years as a standard rule. And let me just say that there is a very strict process for guidance development in the, in the WHO in order to ensure that whatever is here is, uh, has a lot of uh, limitations for possible bias, let's say. So that strict process means that then this is what it is and this is what we can assess and this is what we can say a recommendation from WHO. Of course, it is Sorry, Deborah, I'm going to put in another question. Yes. Okay. Um, Chuck Stenson. Um, I don't understand why we're not talking about the numbers here. Uh, we know that in the Lancet study, it said one third of Alzheimer's is preventable. Well, I was uh, part of the Cooper study of 20,000 people, 20 years, 38% less incidence of Alzheimer's. Mia uh, uh, believes that up to half of Alzheimer's is preventable. Why aren't we talking about that? And uh, why aren't we talking about, like, John Hancock Insurance uh, in, introduced Vitality last September, and they're offering lower insurance costs for uh, people that exercise. Uh, we're taking it to the doctor's office in the family office, and uh, we're taking it to universities. Uh, we're implementing, um, actually, uh, at Kaus, uh, the um, uh, a whole health care program to get to the next generation. Why are, we, why are we talking about these things? Okay, thank you, Chuck. Um, a, a brief response if you want, or we'll get another question in. I, I think she started off with numbers, by the way, Chuck. Yes, some uh, of the numbers are there, and I don't know if we have more now. <coughs> One last question from here. Okay, Paola Barbarino from Alzheimer's Disease International. Please stand up, Paola. I'll stand up. Uh, so, question for both of you. So, you've been talking um, about research, no? and the importance of scaling this up to the global level. And of course, lower and middle income countries are so important, but we were discussing with Mia last night how lovely it would be to have fingers in lower and middle income countries, but you cannot do that, and we know that, because last month when we tried to find countries that have clinical trial, trials in lower and middle income countries for our own webinar, it was so hard to find any country that was even equipped. They're, they, they're counted on the 
on the, on the finger of our hand. So what can we do? And also specifically, what can WHO do to increase the confidence of lower and middle income countries to participate in trials? Thank you, Paula. Is it confidence or is it resources that are missing for researchers? Because the confidence, we can do a lot when we meet partners, and, and, and many of you know, because we meet together, we, we meet and we try to strengthen that uh, capacity, we try to link one to the others. We are discussing with colleagues in Latin America about the possibility of implementing the FINGERS project. We are doing that work, but the resources are not there. And unfortunately, we don't have that capacity of funding research. So uh, that's an invitation for everybody to, to join this effort. And it was mentioned before in the introduction, the great uh, venue that this is convening a number of partners and it has been going on for a number of years. I wish we are even uh, more inclusive <laughs> or, or larger audiences are involved and we interact more uh, systematically also with those countries that need this kind of support and also needs to learn from others and need to know what's happening and how they can benefit from some incentives and possibilities to move ahead. Professor Utterson? Well, this is an extremely important issue and it's embedded in what I said. This must be a global effort. And uh, many countries are precluded from this global effort because of the lack of resources, because of the lack of uh, <coughs> inclusive thinking. I returned from Senegal yesterday in fact, midnight, and we discussed exactly this in Dakar yesterday. And uh, what is needed is again an attention to these issues at the political, global political level. For instance, here you mentioned uh, diabetes, hypertension, you, you mentioned a series of diseases, how they are coupled to the risk for dementia. But the supply of medicines for these diseases is uneven, and very often it's difficult to get these medicines. So, yes, it's a societal and global disease that we have to think and act accordingly. I, I think I'm going to say at this point, ah, oh, I'm very delighted that <laughs> Her Majesty is adding her voice to the discussion. Your Majesty. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to be political, but I have a little question. Thank you for your, your recommendations, but what about drugs? The abuse of drugs. There are so many countries who are legalizing drugs. And I wonder what kind of trouble that will be for the brain and people getting dementia. Good question, Your Majesty. Thank you, Your Majesty, for, for the question. I do not have the answer because probably we need to look at it closely in years to come to learn, to understand, to find out what are the implications. We assume and tend to believe that there is going to be something on that but we still don't know exactly what is going to be the, the implication. There are some studies of <coughs> implications and relationships in youth uh, about, uh, of course, uh, Justin Susan talking about some of the trend right now of legalizing and so on, not in general. And then we believe this is going to be, in the future, have an implication. One of the issues that I was thinking uh, earlier is that we know that we need to prevent uh, the risk reduction and the healthy habits, etc. But it's not, it's something that we talk about midlife on. And we, some of these uh, prevention measures should start early in life in order to be sure that we get at midlife in a better position to be then better able to really prevent. Deborah Castell, Willa Petter Gutterson, thank you so much for joining us and for leading us in the first of our many discussions. And we have a small gift for both of you. I should have given it to you earlier, my mistake, so sorry. Um, we, you'll be discovering a little later on uh, in the programme that we, uh, Dementia Forum is, is part fun.